Inspection and test plans are an essential construction management tool. However, the reality is most people write and use them incorrectly. That's why in this video, I'm gonna to explain to you everything you need to know about construction, inspection, and test plans. So in this video, I'm gonna go through what is an inspection and test plan, how they're used, what they contain, the structure of one, how to write one, to use them effectively, to make sure you're using them to minimize defects and avoid errors. And finally, we'll go through an example ITP. So an inspection and test plan or ITP for short is a document that outlines the procedures, tests and inspections required to ensure that a construction activity meets the specific quality standards and requirements. So if we think about pouring the concrete foundations for a building. There's a series of activities involved in this process. We need to order the concrete. We need to set up a concrete pump. We need to place the concrete. We need to finish the concrete. And then we need to check that it's all been installed correctly. The inspection and test plan documents all the steps in this process and checks against each of these steps what could possibly go wrong and how do we check it's done correctly so it'll check is the concrete mix correct is the placement method correct is the formwork being stripped after a certain amount of time all these things are documented in the inspection and test plan the itp contains every single step in this process and ensures that each done correctly and provides evidence and records that the works have been completed correctly. So inspection and test plans are required for all significant construction works, things like piling, conduit installation, concrete pours, and any permanent construction works. But what about temporary things? What about things like traffic management or establishing site facilities? Well, typically you wouldn't do an ITP for these sorts of activities because they're non-permanent and they're not getting handed over to the client. Sure. You might have a checklist you follow to ensure things are done correctly, but it wouldn't follow the same strict and stringent ITP process. All ITPs need to be prepared before the construction works begin. And importantly, they need to be approved by your client or relevant stakeholders before the works begin. So that's a critical point to note. We write an ITP, we document how we're gonna check everything's been done correctly. And we need to get our client to review these to ensure that they're happy with them. Okay, so now we understand what an inspection and test plan is. Let's look at an actual ITP. So ITPs follow very specific structures. You'll have a heading with the project details. So some background, the project name, the scope of the inspection and test plan, what work packages it refers to, what drawings it refers to, any applicable standards, who wrote it, the date it was prepared, that sort of information. Then you'll have, say, some definitions. So the symbols, who is doing the inspections, the different inspection activities. And don't worry, I'll attach a copy of this to the course notes so you can refer to it yourself. Then ITPs follow a specific structure where you have the test activity, which will be the series of steps to complete the construction work. So you might have pre-works where it's checking the drawings are correct, making sure permits are in place, checking that the works are being surveyed, the procurement of materials, so buying all the equipment we need. So for example, for this activity, we need to buy conduits, what applicable standards refer to the conduits, and how are we gonna check we've purchased the correct conduits, construction activities, and against each of these activities, we've got the specifications that apply to it. So what specifications relate to checking this works done correctly? What test method are we gonna use? How often are we gonna do the testing? What are the acceptance criteria? And who is responsible for this? So that's how ITPs are structured. They step, go through all the steps in the process, the different construction activities, then the specifications that apply to that activity, the test method that's gonna be used, the timing and frequency of the testing, the acceptance criteria, and who's responsible for, for, for performing those checks. So now we understand what an ITP document is, what they look like. The next thing we need to understand is how to write an inspection and test plan as a construction project engineer or manager. You're certainly going to have to produce some of these. So it's important to understand how to actually write one. 
The steps in writing an insertion and test fad will be number one, to review the drawings and specifications of the scope you're writing the ITP for, develop the construction methodology so understand the steps in the process of building one, list out all of these steps, identify which detail and information does the drawing show for each of these steps, and understand what can go wrong. If you understand what can go wrong, you understand what needs to be checked to ensure it's done correctly, fill out all of the relevant sporting information, so the relevant drawing and specifications, the frequency, these sorts of things, and then submit it to the client for approval and get them to provide some feedback and comments. So ultimately, when you're preparing an inspection and test plan, what you really wanna be documenting at the checks we do around the things that can go wrong. That's the ultimate goal of why we're preparing the document. We wanna create a big list of everything that could possibly go wrong, that specific construction activity, and then check that we're not, not gonna make those mistakes. So for example, with concrete works, we could incorrectly get the survey set out. So we might the surveyor might be working off the wrong set of drawings or the drawings might have a wrong height on them. Could use the wrong concrete material. We might procure a type of concrete that's not applicable to that scope. We could use the wrong placement method. There might be some standard way we can't allow concrete to drop more than two meters. It might not be compacted or vibrated properly and get air pockets. We could use the wrong type of formwork or the formwork might not be correctly braced so the concrete collapses. We could have the reinforcement move during the pour so we no longer get the correct cover on the reinforcement. We might miss installing cast in items. Maybe there's a service pen penetration because we haven't checked those are installed before we poured the concrete. We missed doing them or we missed installing cast in items like bolts. When you think about it, for any construction activity, there's a lot of things that can be done incorrectly. So our job when we're writing the ITP is to come up with a list of all the things we need to check to ensure that we're not gonna be making these mistakes. Each of these mistakes we could possibly make are gonna relate to a step in the construction process. So the basis of our ITP is all the steps in the process we follow to deliver the works. Now, regardless of the specific construction activity, there's some broad steps that any construction works are gonna follow. So these I like to think of as pre-works, the stuff we do before we start the construction activity, the actual construction activity, and then the closeout activity. So the pre-works will be things like design, so checking the drawings and specifications are correctly. If we're procuring materials from a supplier, they might have given us shop drawings. We might need our designers to approve these shop drawings. So they're all the design activities. We'll need to buy materials. So basically we want to check we've bought the correct materials and they match the specifications. And we've also had any handover from previous trades. So for example, if we're installing underground electrical cables and civil contractor has put in the conduits, has the civil contractor checked that all the conduits are free from debris and they've been roped correctly? So they're all the handover activities. Then we move into the construction. So this is really step-by-step step, the construction activities involved in that task and checking against each of those what could go wrong and then the closeout activities. So any final testing we do, for example, for concrete, we might get concrete testing done, documentation of any as-built drawings or changes to design, and then hand over to subsequent trades or final acceptance by the client. So those are the steps we want to document for every single activity. Next to each of the steps in the construction work, we document the relevant specifications. So for each of these steps, there'll be a specification that governs whether it's done correctly. So these specifications might be from project specifications, notes on drawings or relevant standards. For example, if we're installing concrete reinforcement, there'll be a specification that says the cover we're allowed on the reinforcement and then that's what we need to check. So if we're allowed 50 mil of cover in the specifications, we check that we've got 50 mil of cover. We're allowed 100 mil, we check we've got 100 mil. So once we've documented the steps in the construction work, the relevant governing specification, the next thing we need to document that test method. So what is the test or check we're doing to ensure the works are done correctly? So this could be specific to a discipline, so it might be concrete testing or compaction testing for earthworks, or they could be generic, so visual inspections, recording photos, or getting material dockets. 
Next, we need to define the timing and the frequency of these checks. So how often will this testing be undertaken? So it could be time-based, we might do the checks every day or every week, or it could be activity-based. More common for construction works, there'll be activity-based checks. For example, every lot of earthworks, or for installing underground conduits, it could be every 20 meters of trenching, or we might do it per concrete pour. So for every concrete pour, we'll do a pre-pour inspection, we'll do an inspection while they're placing the concrete, and then we'll do a series of post-pour checks. So more likely your timing and frequency is gonna be activity-based. And then we need to define our acceptance criteria. So what is the standard the testing has to be? For example, for our concrete testing, we might need to achieve a strength of 32 MPA within 28 days. For our, if we've installed an electrical cable and we're doing an insulation resistance test, we might need to achieve greater than 50 mega ohms when we do the test. So these could be test results, they could be subjective verification by an expert, they could be records like photos, or they could be certain desired criteria. It really depends on the specific check we're doing or the specific test as to the acceptance criteria. The final thing for each of these different steps in the construction process, we need to define who is responsible for approving it. So these could be internal to our company or these could be external experts we engage or it could even be the client who asked the check. So it might be subcontractors doing it for us. It might be an engineer or a project engineer. It could be a supervisor. It could be the client or their owner's engineer, or it could be another relevant stakeholder. So it's important to find for that specific activity who is responsible for checking and approving the checks. Now, when we're defining who is responsible, we also define what level of oversight they give the steps. So there's three different types of responsibility. It could be a hold point where works cannot proceed past this point until that person's approved it. So for example, on a concrete pour for a pre-pour inspection, it might be a hold point for the client's structural engineer. So the client might need to go out and inspect the reinforcement before they give approval to pour concrete. It could be a witness point where they just have to be told about it, but they don't necessarily need to inspect it. Or it could be a review point where they review it after the fact. So it really depends on defining what level of inspection the responsible party needs to undertake. Okay, to make this all a bit more realistic, let's go through and do an example of a conduit installation or a technique. So if you don't know what conduit installation is, it's installation of underground pipes that people use to install and pull electrical cables. So it involves trenching, laying the conduit, and then backfilling and compacting. So we're going to go through and do an example inspection test plan of conduit installation. So you can see a bit more practically what's involved in an ITP. Okay, let's start with what would be the inputs to this document. So we've got the design, the drawings and specifications that show where the trench is going and the details of the trench. So I've got simplified example here that shows a cross-sectional view of the trench which shows the conduits in orange there's three 100 mil electrical conduits they've got 600 mil cover and there's bedding sand around the conduits and then we also need to install a marker tape which shows where the conduits are the methodology is they're going to excavate they're going to lay the conduits and then backfill there's specifications around the materials we're allowed to use. We need to have an excavation permit in place before we do any works. And we need to do compaction testing and mandrel testing. So mandrel testing is when you pull a sort of like a plastic ball through the conduits to ensure that they're clear of debris and that there's space in them to pull cables through. So we need to do compaction testing and mandrel testing. Okay, let's start with our table from our ITP. So this is the structure we're going to have to populate. We're going to have our pre-work. So this will be checking the drawings are correct, ordering the materials, our construction works, which will involve those steps I went through, excavating, installing the conduits of backfilling, and then any closeout activities. So now we go through and populate this table with every step in the process and then all the other relevant information against each of these steps. So for the design check, we've got the issue for construction drawing set. We need to check that this is prior to performing works. And 
The acceptance criteria is before starting works, we have an issue for construction set of drawings and approved RFIs. Requirements around the procurement of materials. So we need to procure the conduits. The conduits we procure have to comply with AS3000, the design requirements and the project specification. We're going to check this each delivery and the acceptance criteria is we're going to collect every single delivery docket we get conduits and attach these to our ITP and the site engineer is responsible for this. Then we've got our construction activity. So the trench excavation will be the activity is excavating the trench to the correct design depths, the relevant specifications, and we're gonna, every 20 meters, we're gonna check this is done prior to conduit installation, and we're gonna get the surveyor to check the depth of the trench against finished surface level. So every 20 meters, the surveyor is gonna check that the depth is correct against the finished service level. So as you can see, relevant specification, the testing we're doing, how frequently we're doing the testing, what the acceptance criteria is, and who's responsible for the checks. Okay, so once we've written our ITP and prepared it, who has to approve it? So internally, the project quality team or any managers we have would typically approve it. Then we need to send it externally to the client or group. This is critically important because we want the client to review how we've written the ITP and make sure they're happy with the checks we're doing. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the job, we're going to submit all the ITPs for them with their acceptance. And that's how we're going to prove to them we've correctly delivered the project. So it's important that they are allowed to make any comments, that they're happy with the level of testing we're doing, that they believe it also complies with the status, but it's going to make closing out the job at the end of the project a million times easier. And then once we move into construction, all we have to do is complete the ITPs as we're completing the construction works. Simple as that. The effort we put into managing process is in correctly writing the ITPs, documenting all the checks correctly, and then all we're doing as we move into construction is going through step by step, ticking off, doing all the checks, getting all our delivery dockets, organizing all our testing, getting photos and records. It's easy as that. And when we're done at the end of the job, we submit them to our client and we can prove we've correctly completed the works. We're going to minimize the number of defects we have any defects we do get we'll easily be able to address and we'll have records of where those defects are 